So you might be thinking, but Emma, I don't even go to the symphony, so this is all kind of useless to me. Well, that's where you're wrong, my friend. You know where else there's non-lyrical music? Movies! These concepts of orientation and visualization are notoriously combined to create the ultimate power moves in film and video game scoring. And the best part is that you usually don't even know it. Just like how visual motifs are used in movies, like the little girl's red coat in Schindler's List, musical motifs can be just as striking and are commonly used. Pixar is known for making their audiences cry, and this is partly due to their use of the leitmotif. In its simplest terms, a leitmotif is a melodic idea that repeats throughout a piece of media, and it's often used to connect different sections of that media to tell a story. You'll see it a lot in Wagner's music and in operas. For example, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild uses leitmotifs to connect sections of music from different parts of the game and across 20 years worth of games. To name a few instances, the Breath of the Wild main theme is also found in the Dark Beast Ganon track that is played during the final boss battle. Dragon Roost Island from Wind Waker is revisited at Rito Village. And Epina's song is played at the stables. My favorite instance is in the Hyrule Castle theme. After hours and hours and hours of playing this game, you finally make it to Hyrule Castle to defeat Ganon, and the music makes you feel a whole lot cooler than you actually are. The development team somehow fit four different themes into one. They recycled Ganon's theme from Ocarina of Time. theme from Link's Awakening. <laughs> Zelda's Lullaby from Skyward Sword. theme from the original 1986 release. These callbacks tell the story of the Zelda franchise, and are cool easter eggs and sources of nostalgia for longtime players. You're probably thinking, this is great and all. But how do these things make people cry? Well, according to Sideways, a YouTube channel focused on music analysis, All you have to do is take a really sad scene and get some really sad music and then play that really sad music over the really sad scene. And then you have the perfect Pixar composition to make your audience cry like babies. Right? Oh, nothing is ever that simple. If you actually want to make people cry, you have to get happy music and play that over your sad scene. Or at the very least, have the music contrast what's going on in the scene. So how about we make a case study of Pixar's Up? The infamous Married Life soundtrack is first heard after Ellie and Carl become friends, and Ellie gives him the grape soda cap as a memento of their friendship. The OST continues to play as the movie shows their lives together, getting married, moving to a new house, etc. But towards the end of the montage, Carl and Ellie have grown old together and Ellie becomes sick and dies. And this is where the waterworks start. But why? Well, because as we see her become sick and we watch Carl lose the love of his life, Married Life is playing in the background. 
Sure, it's slower and it lacks the band ensemble, but it's there. The montage of their life paired with the OST makes the audience associate married life with the positives of the characters' lives. So when it's played in the background of a sad scene, the audience, whether they realize it or not, is flooded with those positive memories. The juxtaposition in emotions makes the sad moments all the more jarring. This piece represents the life that Carl and Ellie shared, their ambitions, their youth, their love. Married life comes to be the theme for family. But this isn't the last time that the OST is used. It's actually used right at the end of the movie when Carl presents Russell with the same pin that Ellie had given him in the beginning of the movie. The audience is reminded of what that pin represents, and it makes that moment so much more impactful. So now that you know this, next time you watch Finding Nemo, or play Mario Galaxy, or interact with any sort of media that has scoring, see if you can find a leitmotif. Because once you hear it, you'll never unhear it. So, in summary, communication through non-lyrical music can be just as powerful as lyrical music, but it relies heavily on the musical orientation and visualization of the performer and the audience. Through various forms of physical and emotional orientation in terms of the performer and the audience, a piece of music can and will communicate infinite messages, feelings, and impacts. With the addition of visualization, the piece can take on an entirely new form, using memories and psychology. Hopefully this video was interesting, and to anybody who stumbles upon this video that isn't my professor and makes it all the way to the end, hi, hello, hope you enjoyed, thank you for watching, and yeah, that's all I have to say. Bye.